Over to you, Tapa. Yeah, that is great. Uh, so our next talk is by Professor Dave Tirumalai, and he will be talking, uh, taking us through his journey through science. So the stage is yours. Oops. Um, I want to thank Sri, uh, Ori, and others for inviting me to tell my story. A um, little bit reminds me of this uh, song by Paul Simon, where it, says, it just says, I'm just a poor boy, my story is seldom told, but now apparently here is my chance, my story is going to be told in 10 minutes. Um, I was born in a very small village, um, 60 kilometers or so outside of uh, Madras, now it's called Chennai. Life there is exactly the same as it was 20 years ago, probably 100 years ago or more. Um, I grew up uh, in, in, in Madras. My family, uh, uh, half of the people in Madras are supposedly related to me and which is sort of a tradition in India in some sense. Um, most of my cousins are, are, are either uh, doing some kind of science or mostly medicine. And this is really what my father wanted me to do. And I was admitted to medical school after high school, but I didn't want to do it. And my dad didn't interfere with my decision to do engineering. That's what I started with. My family, uh, um, my, a couple of my uncles, slightly more one of them, are world famous mathematicians. One of them is in the Quran. And I too wanted to be a mathematician after all, it, uh, Madras produced, uh, or Tamil Nadu more precisely produced uh, Ramanujan, but I quickly discovered that I was not very good in math and so I had to do something else. But I was always interested in math puzzles. I still uh, uh, read a lot about mathematics. Um, I, and, but engineering seemed like a better choice to do. And so I went to IIT Kanpur uh, and uh, towards the end, the third or fourth, Year, fourth year probably, I got interested in uh, physics and to some extent chemistry, but I still knew how to build small machines. And so I built something for a pretty famous chemist who was in Bangalore, in fact. Uh, uh, and, and he persuaded me to go to grad school. I, hadn't, I had a job after, after I did Kanpur, but, but he persuaded I should go abroad and then I could come back um, for the job. I hadn't applied to grad school, but he knew somebody at the University of Minnesota and that personal connections uh, helped me to go there. So these are all serendipity and things that you don't plan for. It happens mostly by chance and, and these are stochastic kicks you get every so often uh, uh, and, and your, your trajectory then evolves kind of randomly. And that's why everyone's trajectory seems very, very different. When I went to Minnesota, uh, I joined the chemistry department, uh, because that's where uh, my professor knew this other person who took a lot of interest in me. Um, but I didn't know what to do, but I sort of heard of DNA. And so there was a very famous guy by the name of Victor Bloomfield. Um, and I wanted to work with him. He was an excellent theorist, but he also had an experimental lab. He, I told him I don't know biology. And he said, you, I must learn some biology. So he advised me to take a class, a freshman class, in fact. And I went there at 8 a.m. and there were 300 people and I told myself, I'm not gonna do this. Uh, and so I wound up working for this guy, Don Tular, uh, who had no interest then in bio biophysics, but he asked me to think about problems in quantum scattering theory, which is what I wound up doing uh, uh, for a while, but I found that sort of not so interesting at some point. I was a TA for a guy, in statistical mechanics for a guy by the name of C. Prager, who, whose style of doing science, he was a polymer theorist um, and a very good mathematical physicist. His style of doing is very much like Dejan, but he was not nearly as famous. In fact, Dejan has followed up on a couple of things that uh, Steve Prager did. Steve suggested that I work on some stuff which I couldn't solve, I've never solved it even to this day, although the problem is in my notebook somewhere. But he also started along with three other people. One of them is Matt Terrell, who is a dean in, uh, of engineering in Chicago now. He was then a professor at Minnesota. They started a polymer physics class, so to speak, met once a week. 
and I listened to these guys, especially Steve, and I wanted to do the research like Steve. I looked for a postdoc in polymer physics, but no one would hire me. And, but Bruce Byrne at Columbia uh, was then getting interested in electrons and fluids. And since my PhD work was on quantum scattering theory applied to electrons, he thought I might, knew, I know, I might know something about that problem. So he hired me, I went there, I worked on developing theories for a lo using localization phenomenon for, for electrons and helium, xenon, water, et cetera. I finished there and then got a job at IPST at the University of Maryland. And on the very first day I met this guy, Robert Swansea, he took me to lunch and he asked me what I was, what was, what I was gonna do. And I mumbled something like quantum effects of uh, diffusion on surfaces, at which point he stopped me and said, you know, in IPST, the value of edge bar is exactly equal to zero. So you should do something else. So then I fished around the problems in polymers, uh, liquid crystals, and more specifically, uh, the dynamics of liquid to glass transition, a problem that I still continue to work on. Two years or so, three years maybe into my assistant professorship, Bob Swansea and I uh, looked at this oracle in chemical engineering in use. And those days it came in a nice paper issue. And there was an article by John King, who is, uh, who is now a professor at MIT on protein folding. And it's a spectacular article. It's quite long, in fact. And the following day, I asked Bob, why should proteins be in the low free energy state like Anfinson said, there's not the rhyme or reason. And so we began work on the problem and our first paper showed that in fact it could be metastable. And then through that, uh, um, through a series of stuff, uh, got into more and more problems in biological physics. And that's what occupies well, mo most of my attention, although we still work on polymers and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, a glass transition. Um, so uh, about six years ago, I, I moved to UT Austin and there I made some collaborations, uh, experimental collaborations, some, some uh, 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 people working on cell biophysics. And so, so my, my journey itself to science, like many others that we heard, is a really a random walk. You meet people on the streets, so to speak, and then you, you maybe get interested and that's really what happened. In the process, I've worked some with experimentalists um, and that's been rewarding. So it turns out that I have 10 bullet points here and these are lessons that they're not my lessons per se, except for the one in color, I think. And these are things that I heard from other people, uh, 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 especially Michael Fisher and Swansea, who are my colleagues for about 25 years. And they taught me a style and a viewpoint on science where precision matters, where rigor matters, uh, where you don't, you're not satisfied with just not just writing papers, but you really want to solve problems. So these guys taught me, as theorists, we ought to pay attention to experimentalists. After all, they're the ones who generate the problems. And our job is to try to understand that as precisely and quantitatively as possible, produce mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. So pay attention to experimentalists. This too is something I learned from John Kahn, uh, who is ostensibly a metallurgy, but is a superb physicist. People in, this, in these talks have told you that you should do what interests you, do not follow fashions. And we just heard the previous speaker just say the same thing. I think it's partially correct. And certainly something you should follow after tenure. But when you want to get a job, you really should be thinking about things that various departments might like to uh, 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 hire you for. So we can't totally ignore ignore uh, ignore what what people people are interested in because you know you do need an audience will support you to get a job. So I mean it is true in the long run. You should network, especially with peers, even if you're shy. This is something I did not do at all for a long time. I still am not very good at this, and and this is super important, especially in biological physics because nobody knows the literature at all on any small topic. We heard about motors in the previous talk and the motor field, uh, even conventional kinetics in motor field is so vast uh, that you, you, you should really have a large network. And in fact, talks like this are sort of important. This is something that Swansea told me, tough problems are seldom solved. 
only the proponents pass, pass on. So even though the problem has been hanging around, you should take a new look at it. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and you may have new ideas that the older guys like me don't because our views are jaded on these sorts of topics. We gotta be lucky really, you can't control this. In my case, I've had outstanding set of trainees, students and postdocs. I've had fairly close to hundred of them about nearly half of them are in the academic world. One in fact is in NCBS. Um, and and it, it, they do say things like luck favors those who are prepared. I'm not entirely sure uh, about that. I mean, yes and no, but you got to be really lucky. And, uh, and maybe if your network, uh, if your network is vast, you will get lucky. So this I found to be extremely important. Do not write papers for famous scientists, but write them for their trainees, like students and postdocs. They actually read them, and that's what Swansig you tell me all the time. And this is indeed true, um, uh, you know, for sure, I don't currently have time to go through all the details of the most interesting papers that I see on the archive or in the journals, but I do pass them along to my, my group members and hopefully they'll educate me. At the end, of course, I have to go through them actually. Be practical, which means you should solve as many concrete problems as quantitatively as possible. This is something, um, uh, that has been known for 100 years. Lord Rutherford apparently told these sorts of things to his, uh, uh, his students or his audience. Uh, so you should, you should try many, many problems. Don't worry about how important it is. And this I kind of agree. And cumulatively, it all adds up. After about 10 years, you've done many, many interesting things. People know that uh, you've done some interesting work. Longevity counts. So. And this is true, even in physics, for example, it's very difficult problems, IC, ITC superconducting mechanism, uh, people still don't know what it is. You have to really try many, many new ideas. The same thing was true for BCS, spin glasses and glass problems are still floating around. And if you think that you can write one great paper and it solves it, that happens very rarely, in, even in physics, but certainly it doesn't happen often in, in, in biological physics at all maybe the Watson Crick or the protein synthesis is an example, but, but, but there are always questions lingering around and that's what happens in physical sciences in general and biological physics in particular. I, I, I think one should collaborate. And this is a point that was raised uh, in the previous talk. Um, it's first of all fun and it's really the way uh, the biological physics community is going. The number of authors is slowly increasing, still haven't approached the high energy experimental numbers, which could be 1,000, but there are, it's not uncommon to see 10, 12, 15 people on a paper. And this is something I didn't do very well. Um, and I think it, it was an error this is because I was brought up in the tradition of doing uh, theory mostly on one's own. So one has to work hard. I learned this directly by watching Michael. Uh, it is impossible to outwork Michael. Unfortunately, he passed away late last year. Um, uh, and if you want to win an argument with him, uh, you need to work super hard and you put all that energy with extreme amount of talent and of course his scientific uh, accomplishments are vast. And these two quotes actually um, are from Bach from 17th century and Feynman from the last century. They both say the same thing. Uh, I worked hard, anyone who works as hard as I did can achieve the same results. This of course, I don't believe. Uh, you know, there are something that separates Bach from others. And this is a video that you can find on YouTube. And he re repeatedly says, I was an ordinary person who worked hard and there are no miracle people. And the, I take from this, uh, the only lesson that if you want to accomplish your best, you got to work very hard. And as we all know, hard work is something we all can do actually, whether one feels one is talented or not. It's kind of like playing defense in basketball. Every, anyone can do that, but there are some people, you know, who are phenomenal offensive players like uh, Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant, and that comes with something else. Uh, but they too work extraordinarily hard. So um, it, these 10, 10, 10 pieces of uh, uh, knowledge that I've accumulated from, uh, mostly from these two guys, it helps me navigate what I do. And uh, above all, I've been super lucky uh, uh, in, in the extraordinary people I've worked with, mostly my group members, 
um, uh, but others, uh, my collaborators as well. I hope um, uh, those of you who are uh, younger uh, uh, would have as much fun as I've, done, as I've had so far in uh, uh, performing this random walk in uh, scientific space. Thanks very much. Thank you, that was wonderful. So I think we have a few questions. So one is, uh, I think Rana's and uh, also Shagni, uh, uh, like what suggestion do you have for people who are trying to switch their fields or trying to venture a new field uh, very early in their independent career? Um, so because I, I, I tell you practical advice, you can do that half the time. Uh, uh, do it and do it often because your tenure time is, I think in the United States and anyone is about six years. It goes by very fast. And at the end of the day, um, you, 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 know, you really should have some accomplishments which are easy to do when you work on things that you know already pretty well. And because there are lots of problems there, you should really have your bulk of your work there, but maybe you can spend half the time uh, navigating new ideas. But after that, do it often, although to produce a substantial body of work in a field, uh, it takes mm -hmm. time. And in biology, for example, Roger Kornberg, all his life has worked on transcription. So, you know, uh, that's a different model. So with Ada Yona, ribosome structure and so on and so forth. But, but as a theorist, you can afford to switch around and you should. Okay, does uh, anyone have any other questions? No. Then thank we you. should all thank Dev and thank you for such a wonderful talk.